um, we would be able to subscribe to it. We may be able to get ah, into it. Right, to change the later on. Later on. Okay, so you're going to do that. That's cool. No, I need it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're going to do. Where'd my books end up at? Are you buying one? I was going to say, I will buy this little slug. I read the first chapter of it, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah? He got computers right. Because I'm a software developer, of the character course. in the book is but a hacker. Of course. It's so yeah. pervasive. Thank you very much. Really it's science, too, so I pay more You gave me way too much. I said it's science, so I get more than the Amazon price. Because I signed it. Yeah. yeah. Hey. You, hey, I see there's a smile on your face, so you're not adverse to money. No, but I'm going to raise it again. Or eat it or something. You don't have that number. It doesn't last long. <laughs> I got, got five kids. kids. Has anyone ever seen, uh, what is it, uh, Total Recall? Yeah. Man, I got five kids. Did you just get four kids? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think there's a lot more. I got five kids. Most of them are uh, sub-kids. Uh, I'm only actually physically responsible for creating one of them, but the rest of them is the buy one, get one free program. Mm -hmm. Couldn't turn them away. They're too cute. Robert who was here yesterday. Right, right, I was going to say. Chicken pin is coming. Did, you didn't bring any of the other ones with him? No. Is he the oldest? Is he the oldest? He the oldest? He is the second. I have one who's 23. He's 21. Then I got do. You know, uh, we had such a really lively conversation going last night, but after I left her, I thought, if I didn't say... He doesn't talk much, which he has he's going to become awesome. a podcaster. Yeah. He's got an awesome voice. He does have an awesome voice, but he also has so a lot of conscious about it. He told me that as we were walking through the door. He's like, because I commented on his voice. He has a perfect radio voice. Yes. He stopped and came out that day. I tried to say it the next day. I said, that's what he wants to do. No, he wants to do film creations or video podcasts or whatever. I was I'm surprised. Even to talk to someone, I wanted to pre order it. No, I talked to us before. You know, we're going from getting, I don't know where you were, but when I first walked in, we're talking about We're going from getting free, you know, everyone used to get the free background. Yeah, and now you have to get from your phone. Well, then it's only 30 bucks, though. It's so only $30, but it's yeah. rechargeable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, it actually now has power. Uh, right, right. For yeah. now, yeah. which is interesting. Yeah. Not at the moment, but I don't know. Yeah, you can use your own device or just use your own device? I don't have the answer to that question. Yes. Yes. Always say yes. Right in the mail. Yes. Let me check my book. Because, because, when you were saying yesterday about, well, you haven't quite started doing it now, because you're following up from vampires. I am following vampires. That is so not right. Yeah, from vampires to accounting. There's a blog post title right there. You know, Dracula had a bank. I'm sure he needed accounting. Renfield probably did his books. Somebody had to set up this trust for him to have some money. You know, it takes a lot of trouble to buy a house in London. Without any documentation. From Romania, absolutely. I'm sure he had a camera. Especially in those days. Pre-9-11. Of this century. Yeah, it's still down. So if I try and pre-order, I get this. It says, sorry we ran into a network error. Oh, no. oh, cool. That from a credit card company. Yeah. Trying to pre order the square on that chip reading. Oh, no. It is. So, a credit card com the, uh, company that builds themself is processing credit card transactions is having trouble processing the search account. Well, because you're not using their device, are yes. you? Well, they're, they're not web developers. Let me pre order it from the square. Well. <laughs> But you're the first person that said they actually wanted to voluntarily pay for a credit card reader. I mean, well, you're not going to have a choice. Yeah, I mean, eventually it's going to, yeah, it's, it eventually is what I'm going to need to use for processing a credit card transaction on my phone. So I might as well get it and play with it. But I was kind of thinking more people would wait to order to see if Square would be forced to lower the price. Because it paid They're only like $14 or something. No, they're $30. Square has, has been so awesome that I'm willing to... Them. They have been, but I think I just saw them somewhere. 
less than that. Oh, right. no, I'm talking about the new ones to go with the new chip and pin oh. protocol oh, that's coming up. Signature here. Okay. Yeah, but so the, the whole deal is the card stays in the reader until the transaction is complete. There's no more magnetic stripe swiping. Okay. We're the only country in the world still dumb enough to keep using them. Um, so what that means is as someone who takes credit cards, if you continue to manually type in credit cards or use an old reader, you, the merchant, are accepting liability if that card is later used for fraudulent purposes. Mm. So the fraud part where the banks have been very generously paying for all the fraudulent transactions happening, the Home Depot and Target debacle um, have finally forced that change. And you know we have to now pay literally for that right. in the form of paying for the new hardware and accepting liability for any fraudulent transactions that happen on that card, really? which that? is a change. Because And that's why I was even saying yesterday, this is not something, if you take credit cards, do not ignore this. Go to square.com and get on there. They have a special email newsletter just on this new credit card protocol coming. And if you accept credit so cards, finally, because it's been over in Europe for a long time. It oh, has yeah. for years. Yeah. We're the only, we have like the smallest amount. If you look at Square's site, we have the smallest amount of credit cards worldwide, the largest amount of fraud. And why yes. are you using Square, not PayPal? Because Be, Square's been at, Square's had the reader out long. Yeah, they're, they have. Their, their, their transaction fees are potentially lower because uh, Square. If you've got volume, yeah. no more volume. No, it's a two point something percent, right? You have the same thing with PayPal? No. Uh, Square is 2.7% per transaction. PayPal is 2.9% plus... 30 cents. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Is Square doing this kind of non-profits? Actually... I, I'm a non-profit, so I get the lowest. I think it's, 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 it's kind of yes. yes. Oh, they find this, so they're matching Square. Yeah. That's the yeah. whole reason. That, okay, they didn't used to do that. When but Square first was out, first. When they came out PayPal here, it wasn't that, that case. The other thing, the other reason is because uh, with PayPal, it's not tied directly to my bank account. So if I if I get paid, if, if I if I use PayPal and I and I, and I get paid with it, it goes into my PayPal account. If I want to put it in my bank account, I go to PayPal's website and then say transfer those funds right. to my bank account. Right. Square, I swipe it, the funds okay. go directly into my bank account. Yeah, like within the next forty-eight day. hours. Well, within a reasonable time frame. It's yeah. forty-eight. Okay. Well, I have yeah. a regular merchant account. I've had one for twenty years. Uh, with authorized.net, mm -hmm. okay, and uh, I was actually, I think I have a wholesale account because I used to set them up for my clients, uh, merchant accounts and stuff, and when PayPal first started, I was like, they're not really a business because they're using PayPal, but now I love PayPal. I use well, here's the thing about PayPal. The other reason I use Square, we're using PayPal. That fits in my pocket. I carry yeah. that around with me. Right, everywhere. right. And I mean, that's actually one thing I'm And those about, machines you know, used to be like $2,500, you know. Well, plus, yeah, to like, you know, mobile some of these pay a monthly fee, whether you didn't even have a transaction. Right, 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 right. But like this, that's actually one of the things I'm upset about the, that I'm, that I'm not looking forward to about the EMB readers. It's like, it's a lot bigger. The PayPal bigger. one it's is the same. The, the PayPal one is the same size. It's just, it's a. It's not the same size. I have it. It's a lot bigger. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, even Intuits was a lot and bigger. It's triangular, so it'll poke it's, Yeah, it looks like a little yes. uh, pyramid. <laughs> but here's the thing about PayPal, and I ran into this. People either love or hate PayPal because you have to link a bank account to it. Yeah. So even when I invoice clients, I offer two payment options. One is the Intuit payment network where you go to a link, a secure link, put in the routing number and account number for your bank account to pay me. You don't have to create a logon. For PayPal, you create another logon and you link your bank account. People either love or hate PayPal, and if they hate it, it's a deal breaker. Yeah. Well, yeah, but when you do PayPal and you use buttons online, you can also pay by credit card. Oh, yeah. Through the PayPal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but but it, people it's that, as soon as they see PayPal, they, they go. The instant online. distrust. Instant. And I'm, I'm telling the you. totally opposite. I don't use credit cards online at all. I, I, I'm the same way, too. I, I would much rather use my PayPal, PayPal to pay right. something, my PayPal account to pay something, because then, like, yeah, my credit card number is never even a scenario. I have two. I have a regular merchant account that I that I enter in off the computer. Mm -hmm. I don't do swipe, because I do everything over the phone. I've been doing it that way for 20 years. Right. I, I think, though, what Jody is really trying to say, and, and by the way, even though I'm technically employed by PayPal for the next, like, week and a half, I, I'm not speaking for them. Um, I personally love PayPal, but the problem is is that there are a lot of people out there that just don't like it. 
And so if you want to be, if, if you're going to, if you feel comfortable turning away business, make PayPal your only option. There are just no, some no. people out there, rational yeah. or otherwise, mm -hmm. they just don't yeah, like it. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. So I have a regular merchant account that I take credit cards over the phone. Mm -hmm. uh, I also had, this was back in the day when, before they had these little readers and stuff, where I'd do an authorization over the phone when I'd go to a trade show. Mm -hmm. um, and now I haven't done that only because I don't really have the need for to swipe a card. With the new person. standard coming, you should read up on phone sales okay. and any li new liability for fraud that you might be accepting okay. by doing phone payments and maybe look at setting up some kind of portal um, where where they would enter their own credit card information and you not because here's the thing and even now with it's called PCI compliance and it's the rules yeah. everyone's heard yeah. of that yeah. it's basically the rules that say if you print a, a report of payments from your system your the credit cards have to be encrypted you can only show the last four digits yeah. if you are handwriting a credit card number on a piece of paper and leaving it lay and it's compromised you could lose because in your merchant agreements you have agreed right, to right. protect credit card numbers from fraud yada 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 if you suddenly have a problem and there's credit card numbers stolen from your place of business right. and it's traced to you you could lose your ability to have a traditional right. merchant account forever right and that's not an exaggeration right no i know so if you know like if you have an e-commerce store you get emails about doing the pci compliance survey thing mm -hmm. To make sure that you have a secure website where thing you're not going to be another Home Depot right. kind of thing. Although right. if you were, it wouldn't. You would be the one to lose your merchant account, not target Home Depot, who allowed their databases right. to be hacked. Right, right, right. No, I hear you. Mm -hmm. I use PayPal online, and I use. My and here's some trivia: um, when Target happened, um, I was 2,000 miles away in Pennsylvania, had no way of canceling my debit card because of course they weren't going to mail the new card and I was gone for like a month. Mm -hmm. um, what I learned, and you should guys should log on because you will be shocked, your debit cards come with standard daily ATM withdrawal limits mm -hmm. and daily debit purchase limits. Mm -hmm. I guarantee they are set horrifically high, well beyond your daily habits and changing those because that was actually one of the things Wells Fargo suggested to me over the phone lower them to what, like are you really going to go to the ATM and take out $500 a day? Mm -mm. Go lower there have them. There been times where I've, needed, where I've needed to do that in, in, in an instance. Some you, of the bank websites... You can always call the bank and have them raise yeah. it. Um, I, I, I'm with USAA and they're fantastic about this. I had to make a, a $4,200 charge on my debit card once and I called them and it was literally mm -hmm. like 30 seconds and they raised it. And not only that, but he said after today, it's going to drop back down to your normal limit. Okay. So right. I don't know if everybody does that, but then if they don't automatically do that, call them the next day. And well, and sometimes you don't have to call them. Some of the, like Wells Fargo, I found okay. out I could log on and change those daily limits myself. So if you know you're going to be traveling and you need to be spending a little bit more, you can do that. And even you can probably set your regular credit card that way but that was one thing and then of course through that whole time I was traveling I was checking my debit card constantly because um, like it was like right at right when they said targets databases were compromised is when I had literally shopped there and find stuff yeah their machines and I'm like crap I just shopped there um, and I was literally, my family in Pennsylvania, I, I had gone home for like a month over the holidays and there was literally nothing I could do about it. Other than call them and freak out over the phone saying, oh my gosh, <laughs> and constantly check my bank account. That's what we get for point of sale machines running Windows XP. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Boy, seriously. That was the yeah. That's well, you, you're already seeing new um, machines, credit card machines and stuff in the store because they already have the chip and pin slots where the card's going to stay in. Um, but if you are accepting credit cards, this is something you absolutely do not want to ignore because you could find yourself, you'll be with the one shut down for fraud and not Home Depot ever. Um, Can I throw one more thing out? Uh, sure. Right? As someone who worked at PayPal, you were talking about PCI compliance. The one thing that it seems like I saw more often than anything else, you know that you know that three-digit security code on the back, okay? You know that you are not allowed to store that anywhere. Which is why they always, always anywhere. Okay, wait. 
as a person or as a as a merchant? As a merchant. As a merchant. As a merchant. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. how does if, if it's your own credit card, write it down to your heart's content. Um, you know, that's right. up to you. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. if you're a merchant say, and you store that anywhere on paper in a database, whatever, well, even you, if it's encrypted, why would you store that? Though? What's that? Why would you ever want to store that? Well, if, if let's say you were to, to recharge your credit card, yeah, yeah. you don't need it to. Totally dumb bill. Well, it, 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 here, here's an example. If, no, no, if, if you're processing a credit card transaction but you don't have the card, you need it. It's like, let's say you did work for someone and you didn't have your card reader on you, and you said, okay, I'll, I'm going to charge you tomorrow, and you need all of their information in order to charge it through manually without swiping the card. Because you swipe it through authorized. I think authorized.net has like a card not present thing where you can bypass it, and I think you're probably getting dinged on rates. Okay. You're getting dinged on rates, and it also raises your risk for chargebacks. Yes, it does. Chargebacks and frauds because it raises your risk because card not they see it as a card not present transaction. I used to get invoices in from merchants all the time and they'd have the credit full credit card number written down which is technically not a PCI violation not. but makes me a little nervous. The full expiration date and then the three digit C V V and even writing that down is going to get you in big trouble with PCI yeah, compliance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with you, Mom. There, there is no reason to to Pass score it, but people back. do it okay. all the time. All I keep is the last four, you know, just a, you know, a credit transaction. You know, mm -hmm. one of the businesses off in the target. One of the questions it's asked the yesterday, and this kind of goes into the credit cards, was setting up an e-commerce solution to work with your accounting software. Um, and I have to say, it's something that I see done very horribly because everyone looks at e-commerce software, good e-commerce software is not cheap. Um, and the, the best way I can say to find software is Zero is the online accounting software I recommend even over QuickBooks Online for a lot of reasons because QuickBooks is just crazy right now. They've even caused, I mean, I'm a certified pro advisor with, Quick, with Intuit and their QuickBooks Online product has just been a junk show lately of errors um, took me a month of screaming at them on social media to, for them to fix my account. And they got kind of snarky about it. I'm like, well, okay, I called tech support. You didn't do anything. Even with my escalated ticket, what did you want me to do? You kind of shut me down. At one point, I couldn't even get into my account. And it was a problem. I couldn't do payroll taxes. Just saying. Um, Zero is very solid software for that for most small businesses is more than adequate. And the easiest way to build out a system would be to go to um, their add-on marketplace. When I started with them like five years ago when they were teeny tiny, hoping for business kind of thing, um, they had like two pages of add-ons. I was one of the very first people in this country to get certified on this product. I was like number seven in the country. They now have like 20 billion pages of add-ons and to build a really cool automated system you work backwards. You're going to use zero, so now you're going to go through the whole list of e-commerce solutions. But there's some features you want to look for because by by going by the cheapest solution, you're there's a hidden cost of free. Okay, just saying. Um, the worst e-commerce solutions will only allow you to download sales. If you have any kind of inventory, you can't run any summary reports. You can't run any inventory reports. You don't know who your be what best customers are. You don't know about your band and shopping cart. You don't know how much product you have, which one you need to put on sale. If you're not using a solution that can tell you all these cool things about your products, then don't use it. Um, and my The one I know that works really well is Shopify with Vend HQ. Shopify is an e-commerce store. Um, the, Kind of the bad thing about e-commerce solutions is the pricing is set up by the number of products you have, which is where keep it simple saves you money, literally. Um, and I see people creating like a hundred products because they have all these minute variations. Yeah. Don't go there. You're just creating chaos. 
that eventually is what I'm asked to unravel, which is why my business is now called Fix Your Accounting because I fix broken accounting systems constantly. Um, if you're setting up your 20 products, you're gonna be in the cheapest subscription. And then the cool thing about Shopify is you can bring their sales into Vend, which is a point of sale that works anywhere on and offline, keeps your inventory that you can run all those really cool reports to know you know, do I need to put something on sale? My supplier just called me and said, I have this really screaming deal. And you say, oh, look at my inventory. No, that's a really bad thing for me to do. What I see people do is falling into the trap of having the inventory literally stored in their garage and not knowing what they have. And there could be literally thousands of dollars sitting in the garage that they're not selling because they don't know what's there or it's stale inventory that can't even be sold and they just spend another 2000 on it on what they already can't sell. So I'm all about keep it simple, knowledge is power. If you set up these simple systems and strategically spend money on these systems, you can have a very successful business and have it automated that you're out there cranking in the revenue and not worrying about stuff like this. But it's the strategic investment in these solutions. And the cool thing I like about Vend is it's the point of sale that if you go to trade shows and stuff that you're just swiping credit cards on the go. And then you can also do your wholesales. It has pricing levels. So if you do wholesale type of thing, um, and if you're selling on Amazon, a lot of the better e-commerce software is allowing you selling through the multiple outlets, Amazon, Etsy, Shopify, all of those. So you're tracking everything in one place, which is the other place I see people get absolutely off track. Um, but Vend will help you manage all that and then send a daily summary into zero so with all the payment types so that everything is very clean and the number one reason people don't have accurate financial records is data entry because people hate it you sit there and text all day but it comes to entering stuff in your accounting system nope not happening not ever unless it's a marathon weekend session where you're drinking you know two gallons of coffee <laughs> so what about just using square register which is free square um i haven't looked a whole lot into their solution i know they recently added inventory yeah the problem is square register I think, I don't know if they have an integration with Zero, but I don't know what kind of detail they're sending in yet because that's also fairly new. If it's giving you good reports, fine. Square is a really cool tool, but the register and inventory pieces are fairly new and they might not have nice reporting yet. Although I would imagine they will soon because it's a very solid product. Um, I would see them as getting to be a full point of sale e-commerce solution at some point because they have their own marketplace right now. The key thing is the reports to know what you're selling because that's where I see people go wrong with e-commerce. That and trying to sell a product that's essentially competing with Walmart. <laughs> and not when you're figuring your markup on your product, factor in this stuff. And know that if you're going to get into serious e-commerce, especially if you're going to go with something like one shopping cart, which is an all-in-one solution, that you're going to spend some bucks. But you're also going to know, because there was a session yesterday on Google Analytics. You should be getting the same type of analytics from your e-commerce solution. Who's walking away from shopping carts? Who are your best sellers? Who are the most repeat customers coming around? What products aren't selling? What do you need to put on sale? how many promo codes can you offer and have going on in your system and and I know in the world of e-commerce because I have a client that's using one um, it's called mail order manager and it's mom for short and you invariably hear all of us going through the office saying I hate mom <laughs> which is like totally awful um, and you know thankfully they are finally going to get rid of that tool because there's a lot of things that have been holding them back with it um, but most people, when they're looking for an e-commerce solution, look for the cool factor for, from, and yes, you want to identify and pay attention to that customer experience on your store, but you also need these analytics. And if you don't use a decent e-commerce solution, you're not going to have it. Google Analytics or not, you need to know the numbers. Who cares if you have 10,000 people going to your store and you're only making 100 bucks a day? Clearly, something's wrong. And you need to know what's going on with this store. I think that kind of answers the question I had yesterday. Somebody was asking, they had like 50 to 100 products on their e-commerce, which probably puts them in like the midline. 
e-commerce search him, but Shopify, VanDHQ, and Zero is a very cost-effective combination to go with. Um, one shopping cart quickly gets you into the arena of supersize. So if you only have a few products, and these are all scalable, which is the other thing I see people run into when they're buying software for their company, they look at the price and not and ignore the scalability part. And then when all of a sudden you hit the limits of that first piece of software and your business is booming, now you have to stop and implement new software and that's not done overnight. Do these things integrate at all with uh, WordPress? What, like for like a front end for your shopping? Yeah, card? just you, you mentioned three. And I, yeah. Shopify, I know they work with authorized.net. You can probably interface it in. There are a, a huge list of certified providers for Shopify that will customize a site for you. And I'm sure they can integrate it into your site and make it look seamless. Mm -hmm. It's, I actually was playing with it. And well, it's just that most of the plugins for WordPress are using Stripe or Mac Yes, Mac yes. As, as and Shopify would too. They'll use Authorized on that Stripe. Everyone's using Stripe nowadays, okay. even Square, all of those. Right. Um, what I would say with a WordPress plugin, again, where's your reports? And more than likely, it's allowing you to collect the sales and telling you no statistics behind it. Okay. And that's the problem. So then where does this fit in? This fits in that it's a true e-commerce inventory okay. management system that's going to give you, similar to the Google Analytics, but for your e-commerce, and okay. the financial numbers to back it up. Okay. You know, what are you selling and, you know. So then this is being used in a different type of website than WordPress. Mm -hmm. my yeah. Question. What you would do is probably have a menu option or a button or something. Um, graphic or something on your main website, hey, go to my store. And a lot of people do that. Yeah, yeah, They'll I say, hey, it. go visit my store, yeah. or the menu option just takes them off to that other site right, right, okay. for that reason. It's WordPress plugins are, are great, but when it comes to the financial stuff, they really fall flat. Mm -hmm. Even someone I had, someone that had a, a Squarespace site, and again, all it did was, you sold something, mm -hmm. cool. How many did they sell for the month? No idea. Mm -hmm. it, it was really, and then it, to add, insult to injury they were selling on Amazon like several places but no right. tool to congregate everything right. together and right. give you the true picture right. so if you're gonna spend all this time setting up a website with your Google Analytics and you know to hopefully sell things you want the analytics on the e-commerce side too because that's your bread and butter presumably you're doing this to make money at least enough money to pay for the tools <laughs> and the product you know <laughs> right. But this kind of goes into the other question I had yesterday. Um, my talk yesterday was basically being able to run your business from anywhere. And I have literally done that because I live in Flagstaff, my family's in Pennsylvania. The last few years I've gone home for like a month at a time and with my little rolling laptop bag, I literally run my business from Pennsylvania for a month. And a lot of people think that, oh, that's just for you know, the millionaires. I'm like, no, nah, I'm certainly not a millionaire. I do it all the time. If you, you know, things like Evernote and Shoeboxed and being white, you know, paperless and you know, strategically choosing the, the electronics you buy because then you have to haul them on the airplane. You can totally do this. So you set up your contact request form on your website that it automatically goes into. Like it goes a couple places for me. It goes into my CRM tool. I use one page CRM because it's fashioned after the Get It Done David Allen kind of thing. It's all about your next action. It also creates a task in Teamwork PM, which is my project management, that I track my everything I need to get done, plus collaborate with a virtual assistant. And then it also goes into my quote and proposal software called, called Quote Roller. And then from there, if once they accept the proposal, once we, so she'll set up the initial console phone call, then I do the proposal on Quote Roller. When they accept that, and it's all done electronically, try not to print anything, um, I use Write Signature, get the signature on the bottom, and then I can push it into FreshBooks, which is my billing tool. Now, I know you're probably mentally adding up all these dollar signs. I use Zapier for, and I, I'm within my five, so I'm not paying for that. Quote Roller, I got in on the ground floor. I'm paying $8.99 a month, and I think it's now 15 bucks a month. Um, 
I do use Evernote, and I guess I was using it longer than you because I still pay $45 a year. <laughs> um, FreshBooks, I'm certified on the software, which means I got it for free. So that helps too. Um, and for Zero, I'm also certified with them. Get that for free because I'm also a reseller for them. So there's some perks to being certified on some of the software. So if there's software in your profession that you can be a reseller for that gives you perks like getting it for free, you know, it's certainly something to explore. Um, so I have all those links on my website. Actually, not the new site, but they'll be back eventually. Um, so these are all the tools I use to do all every, everything from everywhere and. I, the only typing I do is when I'm taking notes, and I confess, I like my paper, so a lot of times I'll write them on paper and then transfer them to Evernote or the CRM, um, and then I'll have to do some typing. I use a template and quote roller to do my proposals, but then I might have to tweak it, so a little bit of typing. So I'm basically not typing, it's all just set up. So basically the way you do this is Start with your accounting software, see what it and what the next step back, and build your system with what tools you need, whether it's e commerce, um, you know, project management, whatever, because some of the project management software that you choose, like Teamwork, doesn't integrate with Xero, but I didn't, that's not a deal breaker for me. FreshBooks does, and that's fine. So, you know, you look at how you want to do business, and of course, this is all not necessarily about you, it's about your customer, your client, and how you're going to best serve them and what tools you need to serve them. And by setting up this system, you're also standardizing how you're going to do things. So you, every time you get a phone call to do work, you're not reinventing the wheel, basically. Um, and it's taken me a while to get this, but I've been paperless. I've been doing this for five years. I lost my job in a recession and kind of answered as on Craigslist, and you know, here I am. Um, my very first client said, and he was already generating a lot of paper in his business, it was a startup. You're gonna store my business records, right? Uh -uh. Mm -mm. Paperless from the start. And if you're heading down the paperless journey, trying to go from, you know, because I worked in corporate America and we're all about killing trees, you know? Um, first time I sat down with my cute little dual monitor to do a bank reconciliation and whatever, all the accounting stuff I do, what? How do I do this? I just totally had to rewire my brain. But once you work through that process, you can totally work paperless. Although there are times I have really, really messy projects that I end up printing some paper just because I don't have monitors for all this stuff. <laughs> and then that's how you can tell if it's a really messy project because I ended up, you know, if I have my Mac and a 20 inch, 22 inch monitor, um, iPad and I have, I have all three going and need another one then I'm gonna have to print something um, but someone asked yesterday well why didn't I get one of the mobile scanners because I use shoebox as my scanning service I actually just fill the envelopes spend the bucks to have them scan it first of all to be mobile I don't want to carry another toy I've, I've looked seriously at scan snap I really want one but I want to carry it around um, so yes, it would be cheaper to buy the scan snap, but yeah, I don't want to carry it, especially when I go to Pennsylvania, that I can just carry some envelopes with me, stuff them and mail them, and they're gonna scan everything for me. And it's out, I consider that outsourcing a task. Um, fine. Um, <laughs> You're done. I'm done. done. <laughs> That's it. Um, as you, I, if you're doing this as a hobby, you can't imagine being in a place where you have to hire help, but this year I actually hired a virtual assistant. And how do you like that? I love it. Mm -hmm. like, you idiot, what did you wait so long for? Mm -hmm. um, if you Google, ask Google, you know, task to outsource for a virtual assistant, you'll get ideas because it's, you're sitting there thinking, I don't have enough to give it a virtual assistant. Yes, you do. More than you think. I um, and the, the coolest thing she does for me is the email and phone tag to set up appointments because I hate being on the phone and I invariably lose track of email conversations and by the time somebody responds back to me somebody else already took that time slot great aren't you using an online scheduler I used to 
and it didn't really. <coughs> I've been trying to use one. The issue that I have is that I need to go in there and, and block out the time that I'm not there. Well, you, and I forget to do that. Well, that, and there's some that now will synchronize with your calendar depending on what calendar tool you're using. I never use a calendar. But the I other. Use, I use a book. Well, that was the other thing. Um, I was had gone back to a paper book because I'm more hands-on and visual. Mm -hmm. And when I went to a virtual assistant, I'm in Flagstaff. She's in Colorado. Right. She didn't work so great. Right, right. <laughs> so I had to go more into my online calendar that she has access to. And, and every now and then I get caught because I forgot to put something on there. I'm like, well, that's my bad. Right. I know better than right. that. Um, but the other thing is I'm using my contact request form on my website to filter clients, mm -hmm. the ideal client, that if you have the opportunity to just go schedule time, and I know as soon as I see the name of your business and look at your website that I wouldn't, wouldn't be the best fit for you, I don't want to create that because then I just wasted a half hour talking to somebody and I need to have to tell them, you know, I'm, I think I'm the best fit for you. So that was, that's the reason why I'm not doing um, letting them schedule up you. front although You're somebody mentioned schedule once yesterday <clears throat> and I thought about using that as a sort of an after-the-fact self-serve type of thing something called acuity really yeah I've heard of that one there's like a bazillion of them yeah. time trade is a really cheap one this is nine it's ten bucks a month okay and it's really intuitive Okay. I find it to be. And then I'm looking at another one that I'm going to upgrade that actually has like a contact manager in it uh -huh. and more management. I basically do coaching. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I've looked at coaching software. I can't find anything there. I've looked at, uh -uh. you know what I mean? It's a, so this one is just a scheduler with a contact manager. What about something like, um, are they buying, like when they schedule with you, are they also buying a product? They or? could. Because look at something like um, Acuity lets me do that, and it Booking and Bug. There's yeah. some there's some add-ons to Zero. Booking Bug is one I looked at, and there was another one, Timely. The um, Acuity one that I do, I all it is, I it embeds right into my website. Mm -hmm. You go on there, you click on the the calendar or schedule. Mm -hmm. um, schedule an appointment, and then there's a drop-down menu of the services that they can prepay. It's so much easier than, and it connects with PayPal. Yes. Okay? Instead of me having to do subscribe buttons that invariably don't go work well with my my right. setup. Um, so, for t and for ten bucks a month, the that's actually a really good price that because Booking Bug is at least 20, 20, 25. Like yeah. or something like that. And I looked yeah. at a lot of them. The only thing I would say to look at for that is to see if it integrates in with one of the newsletter software like MailChimp. You can get up to 2,000 subscribers for free. I'm getting free through GoDaddy. I'm in the process of doing that okay. because I'm a reseller with them and I okay. have 10,000 subscribers. Okay. You know, so, yeah. I wish I had that many. Yeah, I've, I, you know, every time I get up to 500, I start dumping my mail list because where I'm at right now, I yeah. pay 500 is my first level to oh. bump up. Okay. So I'm in the process of, you know, it seems like every time I turn around, I'm having to upgrade some part of my business. So well, that's why I'm thinking the virtual assistant would be helpful yes, in that. Yes, and that's where virtual assistants are sort of like the administrative assistant but in, in the cloud, and they can literally be anywhere in the world. And they will all say that they are they can do everything extremely well, but that's not true. We all have our strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. So if you're looking at doing that, I would go to Google and, you know, list of tasks to outsource to a virtual assistant, some Google something like that. And start looking at those lists and make your list up front of what you would want this person to do. And then start interviewing. Okay. Um, and actually if you reach out to me I can. I'd be happy to introduce you to to the woman I'm using okay. in Colorado. She is very efficient. Um, she can update my WordPress site. She does my newsletter. Uh -huh. She did my presentation I did yesterday. I just said, "Here's the outline. Go for it." She loves doing PowerPoint. So when you were, when, so you matched her with the things, the tools that you were already using, and either asked her, and "Do you know how to do this, or can you learn this?" A VA worth her salt will already be very familiar with most. Pretty much any tool you're using, unless it's industry specific. 
Right. But it, like WordPress, I mean, yeah, they're, they're going to know, be able to, it, you know, if not build a WordPress site from scratch, update really? it. They can do some editing. They can do some social media management for you. Wow. They can do all of that, you know, the calendaring, the follow phone calls type of thing. And I can get back to doing what I do. Because you as a business owner are to be focusing on the revenue generating tasks. The first time she came back to me, uh, I found her through Elance and interviewed way too many people. <laughs> Um, but it was worth it because she and I hit it off and this is she has a perfect tagline for her business. If you don't have an assistant, you are one. Right. Right. Absolutely, absolutely true. Absolutely true. Yeah. So um, she and I hit it off. Similar work styles and all that um, can tolerate my personality. <laughs> I'm, I have to say being self-employed does not do anything to improve your patience. And I'm all about just shut up and get it done. <laughs> no drama. Even with clients, if you cause me a lot of drama, you're probably not going to be my client. That's, a, very that's long. a driver personality. Just I'm because so I'm so busy, I don't have time focused. for the drama. Just have to get crap done. Task oriented, focused. Yeah. And she's the one that actually introduced me to Teamwork PM project management because the tool I was using, um, they made an unfortunate programming decision which made it really hard for me to use their software. I was using Twitter Wrap and I really liked it because it was cheap. Um, and she was using teamwork, so an initial project I did with her, she invited me on a project to hers and list out the tasks and all that, and now I've been using it for at least a year now. And I can set up any number of task lists, I can invite clients, I can invite her, and just go in at a glance and know it has to be done today for everybody. Because so that's I, how you work with her, is that you create yeah. this yeah. co-collaborating? Yeah, we thing. have projects and I add her to various task lists and projects and assign her tasks make sure there's an email notification on it, and then she's on it very timely. Um, I have her doing newsletters for me, but I also want to <coughs> approve them, especially with re recently renaming my business. I'm trying to change the voice and branding, so I have a little bit tighter control right now, so trying to figure out how to say in words how I want my new brand represented. Um, and this is also where don't you can't outsource until you, you have to be able to put in writing your branding and how you want your business represented. If you can't do that, then don't call anyone because you're not going to be happy. You have to be able to define how your business and your brand is to be represented and have systems in place. This is how we handle new contacts. This is how the process my coaching clients go through. If you don't have the process set up, they can probably help you set up a process. But again, you have to make sure it's representing your business the way you because you have your brand and your way of doing things, and you need right. other people to represent that, right. so you don't dilute right. your brand and cause damage. Right, right, right. So I just have one other question regarding mm -hmm. with a virtual assistant. How do you keep track of them financially and hours? Um, and the hours first, I almost said that earlier. The first project, at first, we just did by the hour as an initial, and then after like the third month, she's like, you need to commit to a plan. And when she said five hours, is like, holy crap, how am I supposed to find out that kind of work? But you know what? I consistently go over the five hours. So I committed to five hours. I have a recurring task where halfway through the month, she will contact me and say, hey, I have X hours right now. So that, And that is either my, holy crap, I did a lot of work this month, or, oh my goodness, I didn't outsource enough. Because there's no end of work. It's on me to make sure I give it to her. Right, right. And even I will still go back and Google the you know list of tasks to outsource to a virtual assistant to trigger, oh yeah, I have this. Because you know, sometimes you just need that reminder of what they can do. Right, right. And I'll go, I still go out and I look at that list. I'm lists. asking in the process of training a client to be my virtual assistant. Mm -hmm. Because she already knows. Mm -hmm. And she's computer, she's basically unemployed. Uh -huh. And a computer, she was computer trained, and she can't get work. She's doing caregiver work because uh -huh. she can't get a That's job. That's hard work. Yeah. So I figured, you know what, I need to put her to work mm -hmm. until I can get her to come out here because she wants to relocate here. And she's in Florida. So um, we were just doing it just the day before I came here. It's like I made that decision. I'm going to... Then start with the tasks. I've already committed 20 hours a month for... That's a lot. If you have that much work, but yeah. still, and then that frees you up to keep growing your business because now you can take on more clients and right. you're not doing that back office work constantly. Right, right. 
but make those tasks, set the deadlines, and follow up because now you are also managing. What The other mistake I see a lot of clients make is they abdicate. They'll try to dump all their accounting on me and run away and not be available to answer questions or not monitoring. And they think I'm gonna write checks and all that. And I'm like, uh-uh, you're spending the money. Controls, you need accounting controls. Um, don't abdicate because you have to constantly communicate your expectations to them. If you don't, you're both gonna fail miserably. And I see this happen a lot that because you're so busy, you just, okay, I know this person's off here doing this, even though I didn't follow up with them and re-communicate what I wanted done, I know it's getting done to my standards of perfection. Right. No, it is right. not. Right. right. <laughs> it's a big step, it's a scary step, but I, you know, honestly, I wish I would have done it sooner. Um, I don't know that my hours have gone down a whole lot, but um, it is nice to be able to just forward an email and say, yeah, go do this. <laughs> And not have it get lost. So you don't talk to her on the phone. You oh, yeah. email everything. We we communicate by email, text. Um, we actually have a phone meeting. Your, your list of things to do is by is in email. teamwork. It's it's in teamwork project management. Okay. You need a task management tool, and there's a bazillion out there. One of the a cool one that's free is called Tick Tick. I think it's called. Um, somebody just was telling me about it, and I'm using it actually out on client location. What's it called? Tick Tick, T I C K, T I C K, and it's free, and you can set up tasks and invite team members and and that type of thing. If you're just looking for a basic task management sharing type of thing, I would probably look at something like that. Okay. And there's no end of if you would Google task management solutions or software, okay. you will get like more pages to look at than you want to. Okay. Um, and the one you choose is going to be the one that matches your work style. Right. Because That was the, the problem that I had with the scheduler is that I really don't have like a mm -hmm. 9 to 5 schedule. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I may work straight and then I decide, you know what, I'm taking the day off. And look and at the I'm, scheduling software, rolling, rolling like kind of Acuity schedule. or whatever you said, you're yeah. looking at that scheduling software, look at the integrations. Do they integrate with any task managers that then okay. those those things can automatically go on that calendar? This particular one does not, I, it's coordinated with uh, payments mm -hmm. and scheduling. And my clients can do it all themselves. The thing about it is I've got them all trained to use it, but I don't. I still use my book. Well, if you're going to use a virtual assistant, you're going to have to have a calendar right, in the cloud. Right, 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 right. So okay. you need to figure out what that solution is going to yeah. be, whether okay. you're going to use a Google Calendar or okay. I just converted over to the Office 365 service, mm -hmm. although I periodically say I hate Microsoft. Mm -hmm. um, I was using another service that it just wasn't quite as served me well for five years, but... Mm. Um, one of my clients is an IT guy, so he actually did the migration. And you know, it's easy when you're starting out to change the name of your business four times, but when you have five years of baggage, you know, you won't randomly just change the name of your business because I have a, still a long list of people contact. <laughs> but you need to get your stuff I did, in the cloud. I did the name change thing, and I had been in business for like 20 years. I'm still trying to figure out the, the domain. So I'm gonna have to hire somebody to do that because I really don't know how to do that. The pointing, you you forward your your mm -hmm. website and stuff. Oh, that's actually really name. easy. <laughs> There's one more thing I could learn. Which actually, my old site, my dog ate my books site, is now pointing into fix your accounting. Um, <laughs> it's called my dog ate my books. The dog ate my books. Yes, yeah. it was my old business name, and now it is fix your accounting. Um, and we just did that big switch over um, this week. Migrated email. Um, because I was really worried about my calendar because my VA is scheduling appointments. I was like, I'm just going to double schedule um, kind of thing. So that was kind of a scary few days till that process was done. But this, you're this other one that I'm going to be looking at is called CP something. And I signed up for, and like I said, they have a contact management. And you can actually upload like instructions and things like that mm -hmm. for your clients. It's oh, yeah. kind of like almost like a coaching kind of software yeah. that's with this schedule. Yeah. But they, they uh, signed me up and gave me like a 30-day trial, but I was working on a website, so mm -hmm. I didn't have time to go in there and like look at it. And I just emailed them and I said, you know, you really kind of pushed me into doing this trial and I told you I wasn't ready to begin with. 
So I just, you know, so I haven't actually. Well, a lot of times, if you ask them, they'll extend the trials. They already did. This okay. was back in, what is this? What is this? We're in November now. It was like the end of September. So it was like all through October. I, yeah. But that's the one that I'm thinking that I may go into. And that one will then bump up to like 1995. Yeah. But if it can if it can manage my clients. Oh, yeah. Because you're all sourcing tasks. Absolutely. Yeah. But also, again, for that tool, look at the integrations. Does it integrate with yeah. Google Calendar or one of those calendar solutions right. or even Outlook or whatever you're using right, so right. that it's everything goes into a master? Yeah. Or if it has, chances are if the scheduling tool has a calendar, you can subscribe to that calendar to pull it into another calendar, like what, Google what, Calendar. What, what, so you use Outlook to manage your email stuff? I just changed over. I've periodically, there, there is no perfect email solution. Pick your poison. Yeah. I was using Zimbra because I refused to use Outlook and I'm not fond of the online Outlook interface. Um, I hate the account, the conversation view because I perpetually, those, the software will always invariably match things that don't matter. <laughs> um, and I lose things and I get kind of stressed. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, pick your poison, which, especially even with your, your scheduling tool. Which I one? Yah I use Yahoo. Believe it or not, it works, but if it works for you, yeah. But but the problem I'm running into is, I just had to do. I had to set up an email through my hosting company, and GoDaddy, they're not talking between my hosting company and GoDaddy, and then Yahoo, and then Gmail for the phone. So now I got four places, and I just found something online called Mail.com where you can kind of like put all of your emails in one place and they kind of... Well, you can do that with any solution. You need an IT guy to fix your MX records. Yeah. There's, there's okay. something not right with your MX records. Okay. Or and then... Yeah. Yeah, everyone needs GoDaddy. Yeah, everyone needs GoDaddy. That, well, that was what I got to. Is that the only reason I just got that term, the MX records. Yeah. And because I'm, I register with GoDaddy, and I point to Host Monster, mm -hmm. and so when I set up this email thing that GoDaddy was going to do, they sent me a confirmation email saying, um, you know, you have to confirm this so that you're the from address. Well, Host Monster wouldn't forward my email to my Yahoo account, and they kept telling me that it was the SPF records, you know, on the header on the email. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, there's a text record and an MX record. I, I learned this week that has right, to be right. changed. Right, right. Well, I just fe when I Googled it just uh, Friday before I came to this, um, I had been on the phone with Host Monster asking them how to fix this. Nobody ever mentioned their MX records. GoDaddy had to tell me to go. That's and why you need an Host IT Monster. guy who does not represent personally either company who's impartial. Because mm -hmm. if you call HostGator and you call GoDaddy, they're going to be advocates of their own solution. Right, and, right, right. And, and they're going to say, well, we're not responsible for that other person. Right, and then right, you're cut right, in the middle. Right, right. So are you actually using, like, aren't you, if your hosting server should have a mail server, and so you shouldn't need to be editing MX records. The only time you need to edit an MX if you want to use a different mail server than your hosting server provides. Now, if you want to I don't if you like, want to just I, forward I, stuff I, to Yahoo, that's just a forward. That's not it. I don't the think forwards, you can use, it doesn't work. I don't think you can use, they, I don't think Yahoo is open, has MX, has MX No, no, it's not use. Yahoo. It's GoDaddy, HostMonster claims that GoDaddy's restrictions are very strict. So when it gets to, you know, GoDaddy can get to HostMonster, it will not forward to Yahoo because Yahoo has gotten, back in April they had this big thing with bulk email where they changed the, Requirements and they no longer will allow you to. Well, a lot of people don't like Yahoo. For, forward. Anyone can get Yahoo email address. So a lot of places are very strict on you're not allowed to have a Yahoo email address. Right, right. Well, back in April they changed the 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 rules, right. and I forget what the acronym is that they acronym that they were using. But it's when you do user. a bulk email for your newsletter to go out, the from address has to be the same as the server. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't match, then Yahoo now bounces them. They won't let it come through. Well, if you have your domain from your website, like I use Jody at FixYourAccounting.com. Right, and I don't do that. And I you should be. Okay, the reason I don't do that is because I don't like the email, uh, the webmail on HostMonster. Well, then you have it forwarded to the solution you want, like Outlook to or Yahoo Gmail. To Yahoo, and then or it won't go there. <laughs> 
That's what I'm saying. Honestly, I, I have a Yahoo and I'm going to close it down because it's the most hacked email service out there and I'm tired yes, of it. Yes, that true. And I'm getting ready to migrate some of it into a new direction. So I'm looking for a new solution. Because I have four different places now that i got to ch you know, check my different yeah. emails. Um, it's a pick your poison kind of thing where you could have it come into a desktop solution and still stay in the server and sync back to the server. Um, yeah. IMAP. IMAP, you know, so if you use IMAP, you can use, you can hit it from anywhere. You can use a web client. Right, right. And that's what they were yeah. explaining. I wouldn't, yeah. Any hosting site's own webmail is crap. It, yeah, yeah right. it is. I, I haven't really found is. it. <laughs> uh, although, I just looked at GoDaddy's, and GoDaddy's the webmail is, is nice. Okay. It seemed easy to me to okay. use. But, yeah, you can, the yeah, IMAP, you can even use, like, a client on your machine. And it, all the email stays on the server, so regardless of where you use it, from the right. or on another That's website. what they were trying to tell me. Oh, now you need to use Outlook, and I'm like, no. Well, I don't and want here's to do the thing: I don't want to bring it on my computer. I want it up yeah. there, so I can access it. Don't just look at the email portion of this because you need an online calendar, and a good email solution is going to have email and calendar, mm -hmm. which is where like Gmail right. has the built-in. And, and be able to subscribe to your scheduling software calendar to have it all feed in, especially right. if to bring in a virtual assistant, you have to have, you're kind of being forced into having an integrated solution right. so that for the communication part, otherwise you're, you're setting yourself up to fail. So you kind of- It's been work until now, <laughs> until Friday. Everything, it was working. Everything was working. There is, there is no perfect email solution. Right. Um, I've, well, they, they, when, yeah. when I talked to GoDaddy, they basically said, "Well, you're a business. You're supposed. To, you're not supposed to be using Yahoo. You're supposed to be using 360 and the Exchange." And I'm like, "Huh?" And then when well, I look to see what that was, I'm thinking, "No, that's why I left that before when I used to use Outlook years ago." But I was like you. I tra I have been doing mobile consulting mm -hmm. and coaching for almost 30 years before coaching was even a thing. I've right. been doing it. And I used to, you know, take a vacation and just schedule my clients in the evening and I would be free throughout the day and mm -hmm. go wherever I wanted. So right. I've been able to do that for a very long time, but some of the systems need to be updated now. And I would just well, that. in the Office 365 solution I bought into was not only the, the online email, but the subscription to the Office software. Which I what created, is that? Yeah. The, the Microsoft Office software. Yeah, yeah. There's like a monthly subscription now where you always have it. Right, yeah. Right. Um, I'm sorry. Which I periodically will say I hate that too, and there's other options out there. But I'm an accountant; it's kind of a requirement for my field, so I just right, need to sign right. it up. I'm still using 2010. Well, I was using Mac 2008, which I understand. I learned this week is no longer supported by Microsoft. It's that old. Yeah. Hey. Hey. So it's five minutes till noon. Really? So I figured we'd yeah. go ahead and do the uh, raffle drawing. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm going to go ahead and hit the save on the recording here. Thank you. So, or, I mean, while I'm doing that, do you want to, yeah, one last you, question or any? Last questions? Final thing that somebody wanted to just shout out before the recording stopped? Thank you. Uh, thank You're you. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Heather, you have the floor. Huh? All right, four. All right, I've got the raffles. Is what I 